You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not and, as um, simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. You, you feel this, this nervousness on the phone there? Sir, I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. Well, I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You got to make some phone calls. Hang up the phone. Prank caller. Prank caller. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Packernet After Dark. It is the show where you call in and leave a message and I answer that call. Calls can range from sandwiches and tacos to real life crisis, child rearing, breaking up with your girlfriend, or occasionally, believe it or not, a question about the Green Bay Packers. But anyways, we may have may as well start today the same way we started yesterday, or or um, kind of left off ish yesterday. Uh, getting yelled at by Jacob. I see he's calling again. Clearly did not like my answer about tipping, and um, he demands a tip. So if you go visit Jacob at his place of work at his smokehouse and you do not leave a tip, expect him to come out with a meat cleaver. So let's hear what Jacob has to say. All right, here we go again, Jacob. Here, I don't think I explained myself good enough. We are a smokehouse that does not have servers. You don't get to sit down, and then someone comes up to you. Oh, perfect! No servers. I don't have to tip then. And you have one point of entry. You walk up. We have an assembly line type deal where we have people making the food right in front of you, pulling it right out of the smoker, carving it right in front of you. We have a cut station where they... That does sound pretty dope. I should go check that. I've never been to a place like this. Cut it in front of you. Think of more like when you walk into those like. Uh, Korean slash awesome restaurants you went to as a kid where you just like to pick everything and just cook it up in front of you and then they hit a gong or something like that and they're like tip me and then you feel obligated to tip them but then in addition to- I haven't been to that place either I don't know what where are these places that we have people that pull up I've been to Benihana before and I think you got to tip that guy I'm not not positive but I'm pretty sure he puts on a show and cooks your food in front of you and uh I guess serves you. He kind of like flings your food on your plate sometimes, even sometimes throwing some of your food in his hat, which I don't appreciate because I have to pay for that as well. And just expect that we have curbside, and we do, but if they don't order curbside specifically, then they just call and they're like, bring out my order. And then we have to bring them out like their order and then bring them back their their credit card with all that. In addition to that, our Mm -hmm. biggest point of business is the catering people, Right. right? So catering will prepare an order of anywhere from... I I don't know. I would assume you tip a caterer, but I guess I don't know. But again, we're dealing with service. You know what I mean? It's like an all-day setup. Set up the food, get the food all ready to go, serving all the people at the, at the venue. It's, 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 it's that. $800 to $4,000, and that's not a joke or embellishment. And then somebody will come in just because they think that I'm just picking up, just picking up my catering order that people just slaved away. Wait, picking up my catering order? I don't understand what that even means. How do you pick up a catering order? I'm not understanding this phone call. We have no servers. Everybody does everything. If you have to do the sides, you have to do cut, you have to do front of house, you have to do back house, you have to do ordering catering. The pit master is the only one that always stays in the same. So that being said... And all of the tips, by the way, are tip share. That means that everybody that gets the tip is split amongst everybody in the restaurant working. It is an actual beautiful thing, except for people that are salaried and that kind of thing. So, yeah. And then so people thinking that they can pick up a $1,700 order doesn't have to tip because they're picking it up, even though people just worked literally for like order. days to make that happen. Anyways, I clarify. Go pack I guess hey, Tom Austin. Can I hear your autograph? Get out of here. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know that you're still fully selling me on it because it, it's a massive order and a lot of work, but you just said that people are picking up $4,000 orders, which means I'm giving you $4,000 to do all that work, right? I know it's not going in your pocket, but so what? 
again, doing the landscaping analogy, some of these landscaping jobs are like four or $5,000. That didn't go in my pocket. I got $15 an hour, but I didn't get a tip. It was a lot of work. It took several days to make this lawn look a certain way. And at the end of it, I got a couple hundred bucks in my pocket and no tip. So again, I'm still, I'm still, not, I'm still not getting there. I, it sounds like what you're describing to me is a high-level McDonald's. It's still the same thing. I order, you assemble my food, and I come pick it up, and I don't tip at McDonald's. And it's more work, that's true, but it's also more money. That's why I'm paying more money, but I'm still not going to tip you. It would almost feel weird to walk up and be like, here's four grand and like 20 bucks for your time. Doesn't even make sense. Like, it's $4,000 there. What do, you, what do you want $20 from me for? And what kind of a tip do I have to leave on? Four, do I, am I supposed to leave a 20% gratuity on top of that? No way in the world. You want me to drop like another grand on top of it? Like here, here's $1,000 to split amongst yourselves. So, yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, uh, that's not to say that sometimes you don't feel generous and you're like, yeah, I'll throw a buck in the little tip gratuity. Like, they'll, they'll have the little tip jar thing there and you know, you know they don't make a ton of money, so you're like, I'll try to be nice. I got a little change in my pocket. I'll throw it in there, and they split it amongst themselves. It's 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 no big deal. If the business lets them put a little tip jar out there to make a little extra on top of things, I, can, I respect a little side hustle. But under no circumstances do I feel obligated to tip for me to go pick up my own food just because somebody else cooked it. Well, duh. Somebody always cooks your food when you go somewhere. That's the point. It's like when I go to a pizza place. I don't tip when I go pick it up. I only tip the guy if he drives it to my house because he drove it to my house. If I go pick it up, no tip. Nobody's getting a tip. I went and picked it up myself. Nobody served me. Nobody delivered it to me. Some dude in the back cooked it, and I went and got it myself so that I could avoid paying a tip. So I'm, I'm still not there. It sounds like a fun experience. You walk up, and they're like, what do you want? And they chop it up and they throw it on a plate and then I pay for it with my money and then I walk out. I'm not going to tip you for putting it on my plate for me. I don't understand this. I don't get it. I don't know where the tip comes in. I get that it's hard work, which work is hard work. That's true. I've had a lot of manual labor jobs. I've never had a job where I've been tipped before. Actually, that's not entirely true. I worked at Miller Park and I delivered food and got paid garbage wages because you're paid essentially based on tips, I was a food runner. I ran foods out to the club level seating or whatever, and they'd, they'd give you tips. And that was pretty much all the money you made. I also got a share of the tips when I was a bar back at a bar because the bartenders got tips, and then I got a portion of those tips. And I think the cooks even got a, a portion of those tips as well. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, man. I I'm, I'm not seeing it. And I will be that guy that you hate if I ever go to your restaurant because I'm not tipping you. If somebody drives it to my house, I'll give you a delivery fee, a little, little tip on top. If, if you want me to go sit in the corner and you want to come out with a little notepad, even though this isn't the way you do things, you say, hey, can I get you anything? And let me go get you a drink. And then you go get me a drink and you bring it to me. And by the way, you're making like three fifty dollars an hour. And then you take my order and you go back and you serve my food for me and you come back and you keep checking on me to make sure I'm doing okay and I don't need anything. And hey, can you get me a little sauce and go get my bill? And then here's my card, go run it somewhere and bring it back to me. You do all that stuff, I'll throw a little gratuity on there. If you're going to hand me a bag, I'm not going to pay you for that. I think, I think, this, is, I think we've, this conversation has run its course, Jake. I don't think you're going to convince me on this one. I think I understand it adequately. Although, again, the magnitude is surprising. It doesn't really change the equation. Next up, we got Joe. What's going on, man? Hey, Ryan. Joe from CT. Checking <laughs> hey, in. Hey, what up? Uh, third generation Packer fan here. All right. My grandfather uh, started being a Packer fan in the fifties. I've never thought about that. I don't know what generation Packer fan I would be. I know my great grandfather was a Packer fan, so I would assume it's. But I don't know when he became a Packer fan. I just know that by the time he was, you know, my great grandpa in eighty, he was, you know, a Packer fan. So I don't know. I guess I can call that fourth generation. Maybe his parents were Packer fans too, so it's fifth. I don't know. I've I don't never even considered that to be honest. Uh, for my grandparents' twentieth fifth anniversary, I believe my grandmother wrote out to Green Bay. That time, Bart Starr happened to be the coach, and um, he wrote back. And my grandparents went out and visited uh, them. He took time out of practice meet my grandfather and take pictures. Very cool thing. So um, when I was two years old, about the age where I could sign my own name, I um, had signed a piece of paper 
that uh, stated that I will only be a Packers fan for my entire life. And my grandfather proceeded to put that in his will. Um, I've been a Packers fan since. Probably not for that reason, but Packers have been good my entire life. I'm 38, so I don't remember much before Brett Favre. Um, I do have three kids, and I have three stock shares, which I plan to... You know, lead to each one of my kids. Uh, my question is, though, my oldest kid is seven, right? Okay. Um, you kind of answered this question. How do you brainwash your kids? How do you get them excited into watching football? Yep. Um, you answered that part. I like the answer. My biggest question is now, what do you do if your kids aren't Packers fans? For instance, Maybe they're Bears or Vikings or Lions fans, or even worse, in my area, New England. Uh, anyway, love the podcast. Sorry for the long one. Uh, hope you answer it. Thanks. By the way, it's a vicious lie that I skip or don't answer questions. I've never done that, ever. Um, very cool story about Bart Starr. Um, Seems like everybody's got a really good Bart Starr story. One of the nicest, most genuine people that I could think of just on the planet. If I had to list 10, he would he would probably be on it. Maybe even if I listed three, he'd be one of them. Um, as far as the question, that's kind of tough because it feels as though once you have a genuine allegiance, you know, for example, the way that you and I feel about the Green Bay Packers, it's hard to really change that. Not saying impossible, and I don't know to what degree your kid maybe is a, is a Patriots fan or whatever. Um, I know, for example, my oldest said she was a Bears fan for a while, and I'm pretty sure that was just to get under my skin. She didn't like that I liked the Packers. She didn't like that I was so obsessed with it. And so I think just to kind of annoy me, she said she was a Bears fan, but she didn't really care. She just wanted to, she just wanted to be a contrarian on that. But there's also, you know, your kid goes to school, everyone's a Patriots fan, he wants to fit in, he wants to be a Patriots fan. So I, I, I don't know. The best that I can say is to do what I said. If you're able to watch Packer games, make it a fun event. It's hard, too, because you probably don't have a lot of friends and family that are Packer fans, which is also part of the experience. You can have friends over, you can have family over, and you have these big Packer parties, and it's a fun experience for your kids. You can still make it a fun experience, but if you can't even watch all the games and you can't really involve other people because there's not a lot of Packer fans, it does make it a little bit harder. So it's Whenever you can watch a Packer game, trying to make it as fun of an experience as possible, but you know it kind of gets to the point where they just roll their eyes or what. So it may just, you know, keep trying. I'm not saying give up, but it may just come to the point of accepting the fact that your kid is a legitimate Patriots fan. That's just the way it goes, and making it fun. You know, my grandpa was a Patriots fan, and you know we call each other and talk on the phone and it was just kind of a fun rivalry thing obviously Packers Patriots don't play each other a ton but they're both good teams they both compete you can take an interest in his interest or her interest or whatever which which is the Patriots I hate I hate to be a defeatist I'm just saying I, I know how it, it may be fighting a losing battle and it may get to the point where it, it just becomes more negative than positive where you're just trying to really push it um and they end up really hating the Packers because you keep pushing it and because you're so obsessed with something. I know, actually, there was a, a good friend of mine who was born and raised in Wisconsin, huge, huge, huge Brewers fan, but also a Bears fan. And the reason he was a Bears fan had nothing at all to do with the Bears. It was because when his uncles and everybody would come over to the house, it would be for a big Packers party. And he wanted to hang out with his uncles. He wanted them to be interested in him. He wanted them to, you know care about his existence and all they wanted to do was watch the Packer game and talk about the Packers and all this stuff and so he developed a hatred for the Packers and decided to be a Bears fan out of hatred for the Packers so it can backfire all I can tell you is to make it fun make the Packers fun make the Packers interesting and if if he or she does not want to come over to the light then make the rivalry fun enjoy football together enjoy the draft together enjoy talking about the Patriots and the Packers and the differences and all that kind of stuff and and just just let it be what it is, I guess. I don't, I don't know what else to say about it. That's my thought. All right, next caller, you're on the air. Hey, is uh, Ryan there? Yes. Hi. Ryan. Hello. Yeah, this is Scuba Steve again. Hey, Scuba Steve. Is this Ryan? This is, indeed. Okay. In fact, yes. Um, well, 
I, I took your advice and I got another car warranty. All right. And now I have four, one for each tire. Okay. Um, Makes sense. I don't have a question today. <laughs> yeah. But my question is. <laughs> I'm sorry. When should the Packers start to fear the Lions? Okay. Okay. That That's my question today. Okay. And, uh, yeah, thank you for your time, Tom. Yep. Very welcome. Um, <laughs> I don't have a question today, but my question is that, uh, that got me. When should the Packers fear the Lions? Let's, let's look at the schedules real quick. So it's not impossible, I'll say, for the Packers to start 0-1 against the Minnesota Vikings. I'm not saying it's likely, but it's certainly possible. Um, and it's also possible with Tampa Bay Week 3 for the Packers to end up 1-2 and two to start the season. The Lions are looking at the Philadelphia Eagles, which is not a game that for sure is going to be a loss. I think the Eagles and Jalen Hurts is kind of struggling right now in camp. He's not looking super horrible, but there are some serious questions about him um, in camp. Washington is not that great of a team. Minnesota is decent enough, but beatable. Seattle is a complete joke. Uh, And then they have New England. I, I think if they get through this stretch, having lost... I don't know. If they go three wins, it might be something to keep an eye on. If they go four wins, it's like, all right, this is kind of legitimate. You know, let's say their one loss is to the Vikings, then they would have had to have beaten, um, at the very least, the Eagles and Patriots, which are somewhat formidable. But the thing is, even if these are all bad teams, let's say the Eagles, Commanders, Vikings, Seahawks, and Patriots are all bad teams. Still, if you win four as a bad team, that's not going to happen. If the Lions aren't significantly improved, they're not going to just accidentally beat four teams. But I think the biggest challenge is going to be beating a team that is just legitimately a good football team. And that's going to happen kind of on the next stretch, which is after their bye in week six. They got the Dallas Cowboys, Miami Dolphins, Green Bay Packers. If we see them hang in and beat these teams, and obviously if they end up beating the Packers with a pretty good record, then it's time to fear. But I think by the time we see them in week nine, there's going to be somewhat of a general um, understanding of what Detroit is. So, and, and, and on top of that, we, as far as when should we fear the Lions, it depends what we are also. If we come to this with a worse record, because we lost to Minnesota, we lost to Tampa, potentially lost to the Patriots, and uh, we got Buffalo week eight. I mean, we, we could possibly have four losses. I, I'm assuming we're not going to lose to the Bears, the Giants, the Jets, or Washington, I would assume, even if things are going really poorly. But I'll say if we have a similar record, they have a bye, so we can't have the exact same record. But let's say we each have three or four losses. Yeah, you, you got to take them seriously at that point. Otherwise, it's just the same fear that you always have with Detroit, which is they suck, but they tend to play the Packers really well, so we'll see how this goes. But um, they're going to have to be able to prove, first of all, that they can win football games, period. That they're not just one of the worst in football and they lose to everybody. Um, they have to have consistent winning record insofar as roughly a 500 record. And then again, ideally they've beaten at least one adequate team. And I don't know who the adequate teams are going to be because we haven't seen them yet, but I tend to think Philadelphia will be at least adequate. Minnesota, um, New England should be at least adequate. Dallas, probably Miami is kind of my, my wild card. And that's just who they play before they get to the Packers. After that, they got Buffalo. If they happen to find a way to beat Buffalo, then we should all be terrified. Because if they can beat Buffalo, they can beat probably just about anybody. Um, otherwise, they got a pretty cake schedule. Uh, I don't, maybe not the Jaguars. I don't know what they're going to be. Um, Jets, Panthers, Bears, and then Packers again. I guess on a more team level, the fear would probably start... You know, the, the, the biggest thing is on the offensive and defensive side, I assume the defense is going to be putrid, the offense is probably going to be mediocre. If each of those things take a step, in other words, the offense is actually quite good. Jared Goff is operating behind a solid offensive line and has some serious weapons with Chark, with Amon Ross St. Brown, and eventually with Jamison Williams and or Quintez Cephas if Jamison is not playing. And it just proves to be a pretty lethal combination and the running backs can do kind of something. And then on defense, they're not putrid. They're even mediocre with Aiden Hutchinson possibly being just a dominant pass rusher. And, and really, it just takes like one really good thing like that. Because even if you're not a super great defense, if you've got a guy that's just destroying your quarterback, you're going to struggle. 
And they might have decent enough safeties and, and corners to at least be able to compete. Now, the defensive line and linebackers, I don't think there's really any hope for, but if you got pass rushers, adequate DBs, and a good offense, you can you can stumble into several wins, and you can probably stomp on some necks, like just absolutely crush and knock some teams out. And that's another thing that's going to make you nervous about the Lions. If, if it's not like they just happen to eke out a win against a quality opponent with a last-minute field goal, but you're facing a decent opponent and you win by 14 17 points then it's like oh my goodness this sucks this is scary because they because they don't even have that good a talent yet they're just starting to build this thing out so that would be um the frightful thing anyways what's going on caller caller you're on the air all right hey Thomas Austin. <laughs> yeah. are you trying to just sound depressed now because you're just trying to get sympathy points or are you dying of some kind of a horrible disease and i feel horrible about that but please just let me know because <laughs> you're like crying on the phone right now a couple of questions question number one why is it that we're so big on romeo dobbs before the season but yet we get after the vikings for enjoying the preseason and then second question <laughs> I hate that I'm legitimately concerned because I'm pretty sure you're messing around, but what the heck are you doing, man? Why do you people do this stuff to me? You're freaking me out. All right. No, but again, actually a very good question. Um, why is it we're so big on Romeo Dobbs, but we give the Vikings a hard time for enjoying the preseason? And, and I get what you're saying because we very regularly will say things like they are the off-season champions, right? They're bragging about everything. I think there can be some hypocrisy. I'm not going to claim hypocrisy on this. I think I've been kind of fair. Um, I, I think that my general judgment on the Vikings is the fact that every year they think they're going to be such a great team. And usually it's before training camp or anything even starts. But even still, they'll go out and get guys. And, and, and again, when they got Yannick Ngakwe, it wasn't like, ha ha, you guys are stupid because you have any kind of belief that you're going to be successful. It was, you guys are stupid for believing this guy who isn't good is going to be good just because everybody's telling you he's going to be good and because every, you think everything you do is going to be great. And it's not because I'm looking at what he does and he's not a good football player. And again, just kind of generally laughing at the Vikings because every year all these moves are going to be great. They're going to be elite. They're going to be all these things. And um, it just never pans out. So it's just worth mocking and laughing at them. However... I have made comments in terms of some things looking positive for the Vikings. For example, um, in some of the updates that I've given, I've mentioned that Andrew Booth actually looks really solid. During OTAs, apparently he was making all kinds of big plays. I guess he's on second team now, which is surprising, um, because it was my understanding that he was first team and, and was getting picks and was making all kinds of plays. But um, I never once said, you know, ha ha, you bunch of idiots I actually think Andrew Booth is going to be good. It's here's the reports. Obviously, we don't know anything, but so far, Lewis Seen was, was second team, hasn't done much yet, but Andrew Booth seems to be the real deal so far. That was the way I, I reported that. So it, it's not as though, again, I've, I've never said, ha ha, you bunch of idiots actually think Andrew Booth's going to be good. I, I mean, he might be. That's, that's, I mean, they're just doing what we're doing, which is reporting the news, and the news is Andrew Booth has been pretty solid. So I don't have an issue with that. Now, I did do that a little bit last year with Justin Fields, um, mostly just because I, I hated everything about what the Bears were doing and actually thinking that it was going to make a big difference. But the, the reports about Justin Fields were looking <clears throat> quite promising, and I, I tried to go back and refute it by looking at Trubisky looking good, and, and obviously he didn't, so I couldn't. But, but likewise, the reports about Jaquan Brisker have been very good. Kyler has been a little bit iffy. He's probably going to start just because they don't have anybody which is kind of funny. Somebody was mentioning that about the Bears. One of the guys was bragging about what a great job of drafting he's done because it looks like there could be four players that are actually starting. And there was another Bears guy that was like, couldn't it just be because our, our roster is so garbage? And that's the reason. And really, that is the case. I mean, it's not to say Kyler and Jaquan aren't super great football players, but on a team that had really good corners and safeties, those guys wouldn't get a shot. It's because they don't have an answer at corner, and they don't have a second safety outside of Eddie Jackson. And to be honest, Jackson isn't any good either, but they paid him a billion dollars, so he's going to be out there. That's why they're just going to be thrust into that role. Same with Valus Jones. He might just be launched into the starting role because their other wide receivers are so trash. And to be honest, he's having a good camp, but it's just a lack of competition. 
on top of that, you got guys like Braxton Jones, um, uh, fifth round pick this year, who's getting snaps and could potentially play, which is not a good sign for anything. I don't think he's going to win the job, but he very well may. Um, Aiden Hutchinson, again, I just I just got done talking about the reports about him have been real good. Um, even uh, even even though he was last year, looking at Penny Sewell, looking like an absolute freak. Now, it's just the offseason doesn't necessarily mean anything, but these are the reports that we have to work with right now. Aiden Hutchinson and, and Penny Sewell look like absolute freaks, and so that's what I'm operating with, is, you know, if I had to pick, and I think that's all training camp is. It's not, it's not anything definitive, but if I had to pick on whether or not they're going to be good or bad, I'm going to start with the reports, and then I'll just add in a massive caveat that says, but we don't know because it's training camp, and there's a lot of there's a big gap between what they're doing in training camp and what they will end up doing in the regular season. So that's my thought on that. But the Bears, why are we so quick to write him off? This is 8, 0, 8 18 in the morning, he called. So I was trying to think, maybe he's like hammered drunk at 2 o'clock in the morning or something. No, this is eight eighteen. Could just be tired. I don't know. I don't know. Because they are also a football team, so we should respect them. And then... Third- <sighs> this is freaking me out. Um, <laughs> what are you doing? Stop doing things, Thomas. Why are we so quick to write off the Bears? Because they're also a football team. A um, couple thoughts. First of all, the reason is because of their roster, and it's not good. It's worse than it was last year, and they weren't good last year. Um, I will say, though, again, my my tune on that has turned around a little bit. I think their offensive line can be significantly better than I expected with Riley Reef coming in, Michael Schofield coming in, um, Lu- Lucas Patrick being their center, uh, Larry Borum possibly taking a second-year leap, and then, and then Cody Whitehair. Kind of, he kind of fluctuates between being garbage and being adequate, and depending on how he plays. I mean, it, it could be an adequate offensive line for sure. Um, Justin Fields could easily take a second year leap, and if he does, that would have a massive impact on the the Bears. They've got, if nothing else, Mooney. They've got Montgomery, uh, Khalil Herbert at running back, impressive. They do have a more Packersy scheme, which maybe that'll do something. I don't know. I don't have a massive amount of respect for their defense, but Robert Quinn did a great job last year. Al Qadin Muhammad has experience with this defensive scheme. Travis Gibson was pretty decent as a pass rusher last year. I don't know what the change in defensive scheme is going to do for these guys, but it's whatever. Um, and again, they they added two defensive backs, which maybe will be able to help things out. Um, along with Jalen Johnson possibly taking an, an, another step, which he needs to do. He's not as good as Bears fans say he is, but he's not terrible. Uh, Trenton Gill, the punter, which was, you know, they lost O'Donnell, and, and this is the only guy that's there, and I kind of laughed at him like, wow, you're just going to just gonna draft a guy in the seventh round and be like, you win the job, no competition. That's crazy, but apparently he's been crushing it in training camp. Um, so, you know, and, and if nothing else, Valus Jones... We all laugh at him because he's just a special teamer, but if that dude ends up being just an absolute killer as a kick returner, that's going to kind of suck for everybody. Then you give Justin Fields a short field. <laughs> and, um, you know, people have done more with less. But now, again, none of this is a guarantee. We don't know what Justin Fields is going to be. We still don't even know. I mean, Riley Reef and Schofield haven't even officially won the jobs yet. Pat Lucas Patrick is, I believe, still hurt. I think he's going to be back, but whatever. Um, there's no guarantees of, of second year jumps. There's no guarantee Cody's going to have a good year. We don't know Larry is going to take a step. Uh, their tight ends are garbage. Montgomery has not actually been able to really do very much. Khalil Herbert was a significantly better running back, but I'm sure Montgomery's still going to end up winning the job. Um, you know, so so down the line, it, it could obviously go in the negative. But I'm coming around to the possibility that it could be a decent team if if everything falls properly. They could be a decent enough team. So. Um, I'm not going to bet the under on them just because I don't know. And I'm not going to bet the over because I don't know. But the, the answer to your question of why are we counting them out is just because I'm looking at the roster and it's really just not great. Counting them out of what, I guess, would be kind of the important question. Counting them out of the playoffs, yes. Counting them out of, of some form of contention, I, I, you know. Maybe they can compete. They could be better than the Lions. Maybe they're better than the Vikings even. I don't know. 
Probably not. But if, if you get the absolute best out of the Bears and say the Vikings are kind of in a red shirt year where they're trying to figure things out a little bit, it could happen. I mean, the, the Vikings have a better roster. I'm just saying it's possible. Anyways, what else you got for me, Sad Tom? This question for the Lions. Why does Jamal Williams look more happy there than he did with the Packers? Is that what you wanted me to say? No, not again! <laughs> so we're just running through the NFC North. All right. Um... I don't. I haven't noticed that. It's it's hard for me to even picture him being happier than he was when he was here because he's the happiest person on earth. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's it's a more laid back environment out there because the lions don't care. I don't know. I don't. I don't have an answer because I can't verify that that's even true. In fact, I'm just going to call you a, a, a dirty liar if that's if that's okay with you. Next caller, you're on the air. Okay, hello, Ryan. Hey. This is TJ from Down Under. Oh, boy. I got a couple questions for you, mate. Question number one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you think it would take for the NFL to reach global? Oh, no. This is so bad. I guess I would probably say appearance. And number two. I don't even know the question. I'm, I can't. Why is it that rugby players don't translate well to the NFL. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this, mate. Boy. This sounded like a mix between Australian and Cockney, like a, a London accent, you know? Um, but anyways, oh boy, the accents have been just brutal lately. You should have an accent contest. Just have people call in, do their best, you know, European slash... Australian accent, that is Scottish, Irish, English, Australian, because they're all kind of similar, you know, just just levels of uh, like how heavy of an accent it is, you know, you got like English, then Australian, then you make it a little heavier, it's Irish, you make it a little heavier, it's Scottish, it's kind of how I view it anyways. What the heck was your question? What do you think it'll take for the NFL to reach global, I guess I'll probably say a parent and number two, so that. That's probably not what you said. Let me listen to it on my own and see if I can figure this out. Appearance. Global appearance is what you came up with. All right. Look, I think the way they're going to get this done is through persistence. They're going to continue to reach out to different markets. They're clearly making their presence known in the UK. Now they're getting out into Germany. And who knows, maybe someday they'll get down under. But at this point, it's just about persistence. Continue to drive out your message, your product, to the European audience, Mexico, Canada, Australia, and eventually your numbers will improve. Next question. Number two. Why is it that rugby players don't translate well to the NFL? That's what it was. Um, I'm not going to do the accent thing again because it's too hard to try to do think two things at once. Um, because it's a different sport. That's really it. I was reading an article about... Um, Amari Rogers and how he kind of got into shape and everything. And he was working out with an Olympic gymnast, I guess. And they were talking about how his conditioning was just absolutely horrific. And although there may have been some truth to that, I think a bigger part of it that would be a little bit more fair is it's not that his conditioning was terrible. It's that his Olympic uh, training regimen was, <laughs> was lacking. There, there is a football shape and then there is track shape. There is a general conditioning. Somebody that's a football player is going to be, you know, more conditioned at doing track exercises than, for example, me, just based on general conditioning. But there is also an element of your body isn't used to doing those types of things, right? I mean, boxing training, NFL training, gymnast training, it's going to be different. And if you take a gymnast and try to put him in a boxing ring, he's going to get winded, even though he's incredibly in shape, because it's just a completely different thing that your body is not used to. The bursts of energy and the duration and the, the, the body movements and the body types and, and just all these different things your body is not used to. It's not as though your conditioning is bad. It's just that what you're doing is different and your body isn't used to it. So Amari Rogers got in shape to be able to do that. And, and granted, his, his general conditioning certainly got better, but it's just different. And I think that's the case here. It's, you know, you feel like it should translate because, hey, it's a ovalish looking ball that you kind of throw around and there's tackling involved, so you should be kind of good. Completely different. 
you know, just think about how challenging it is for someone from college to get into the pros. When when they come into the pros, it's as though they never played football before. We talk about these rookies as though we got to build them from the ground up. These are guys, some of these guys have spent their entire life playing football and you got Matt LaFleur and these guys who are, who are teaching them basics, fundamentals. They're teaching quarterbacks about footwork. So I, I think that's the biggest thing. That there's some gen- very, very basic overlap between the two. But, you know, not a bunch. I mean, you, you basically know nothing about NFL football. And, and even on top of that, there is a, a body type for a rugby player that doesn't necessarily fit into the body type for an NFL player. They might be some position, like a fullback maybe. But you look at how specific we are with some of these positions. You know, running backs are 6'1", 220, or 5'10", 220. But the point is, there's like a specific height, weight, speed. You know, and if you're a little bit faster and and a little bit this and a little bit that, you're probably not a running back, you're a wide receiver, and we're going to make you make that change once you get here. And your conditioning, your body weight, your muscles, your uh, even your proportion, your lower body strength compared to your upper body strength, and you know, the size of your hands and all these things correlate to what it takes to be really good at this thing, which is going to be very different than what it takes to be a good rugby player. It's why if you take an NFL player and put him in rugby, it's probably not going to be a, 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 an Olympic caliber rugby player. He might be, but he doesn't know how to play rugby and he's not built like a rugby rugby player. So them is my thoughts. Why don't we take a break right Shia? Do not forget to head over to pristineauction.com. It is the most trusted sports memorabilia auction site anywhere online with an A-plus Better Business Bureau rating. Auctions at Pristine Auction start at just a dollar, and they have over a thousand autographed items. So you're going to end up winning signed, authentic signatures at affordable prices. There are fantastic deals happening every single day at pristineauction.com. Every single item that you end up buying, that you end up winning, comes with a certificate of authenticity from the industry's most reputable authenticators. And when you sign up, please remember to use promo code ROGERS. You're going to get $10 off your first item. But in addition to that, most importantly of all, you're going to be entered to win a signed Quay Walker jersey. And believe me, I know that every time we do these giveaways, like four people sign up. So you have an incredibly good chance. If you go right now to pristineauction.com, links are in the description of this show. Sign up and use promo code ROGERS. You got a real good shot at this. This is your chance to win. All you got to do is go to their website and sign up using promo code ROGERS, R-O-D-G-E-R-S. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not as uh, simple as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened up so many more doors. The show is called The The Deal. Deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. I just that. I'm pretty good. Thanks for asking. Of course I watch both. My name is Homestar Runner. 
Your name is Homestyle Runner. I've been saying Homestyle Auto this whole time. Um, just for the record, to get everybody caught up on what in the world is going on, um, Homestyle had a girlfriend. We helped him out of that relationship. It wasn't my choice. It was his choice. But he got out of the relationship. We met his cat. And then he said he's bored and he needs a hobby. And I asked him to expand on that and asked him things like, do you like sports? And apparently he does like sports. Let's continue. What could be a better baseball name than that? I'm pretty much an expert on sports like golf, baseball, soccer, touchdown, cheerleading. Mm -hmm. I can have to cheerleader. She is so hot. All right. Um... I guess it helps a little bit. I, maybe you should start a sports podcast. That could be your hobby. You could do a, a golf podcast or a touchdown podcast or a cheerleader podcast or something. Just a thought. I don't know. It's just what's at the top of my head because I'm I'm physically doing one right now. So um, it's also woodworking. You know, I guess that's a thing. Uh, grilling, something else I like to do, I like making food. It doesn't have to be grilling. It could just be cooking in general. It could be baking. Baking is delicious. Uh, I've been making this uh, crumble thing pretty much daily. I've been making them because we got this peach truck and we bought a big old thing of peaches. And um, so we're pretty much every day just making this uh, tray of crumble, which is simple. It's just peaches. And then I throw in some like sugar, vanilla, cinnamon. And then the crumble you put on top is just equal parts flour, brown sugar, and then butter. I don't, I don't really know how much butter you're supposed to put in there, but I just slowly add it until it kind of gets the right crumbliness sprinkle it on top put it in 350 for a half hour dude dude get you some vanilla ice cream some vanilla bean ice cream or something man it'll change your life i'm guessing you're into food everybody's into food just pick a food that you like and uh, make it a thing that you do where you make that food really good all the time you know if you like italian food just make a decision that I'm, I don't need to go to restaurants. I'm going to learn how to make the best Italian food in the world. Fortunately, we have a thing called YouTube where you can learn anything and everything. And they will teach you like the best chefs in the world are like, oh yeah, I'll just do a video on how to make the best Italian food that's ever been made. And then you just learn how to do it. And it's crazy. Uh, you can make your own pasta. That's going to take some practice. I've never done that. I tried to make pizza dough once uh, from scratch. It wasn't great. I did something wrong. I'm not entirely sure what, but anyways, you know, you practice it, you get good at it, and you make amazing food. And it looks like we've got a flurry of calls from the family. Let's see uh, what chores I didn't do today. Hi, Dada. My name is Riley. Hi. Nice to meet you. What is your favorite food to make me? Bye, I love you. Bye, I love you. Um... My favorite food to make you, I'm leaning tacos just because I get excited by how excited you get about tacos. And it's like a thing that we get to do, you know, but um, you're kind of kind of starting to not like tacos as much. So now it makes me sad. So trying to think of something that I make that you absolutely love these days. You might need to come up with a new thing because it's like peanut butter and jelly you like. I made you tuna for the first time yesterday, which you liked, although you finished half of it and decided you were done eating. But that doesn't necessarily mean you don't like it. It's just what you do with food. Um, I'll say tacos, but I'm, I'm, I, as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking we're going to have to come up with something else. I'm going to have to come dig into my bag of tricks and see if I can come up with a food that's really good that you're really going to like. Next up, same phone number, presumably different caller. Hi, Pack Daddy. It's your wife. Oh, I was wondering if you could describe the time. That is the first time she's called me that. It's very uncomfortable. We went to family night at Lambeau. And if you could go again, what would you do differently? Okay. Which Packer player, current or former, would you most like to interview? Okay. And what is your favorite thing to wear as far as Packer gear goes? Okay, thanks. Bye. All right. You're welcome. Bye. Um, could I describe family night? Well, we, I don't even know if I remember. Did we get a hotel? I think we got a hotel. Pretty sure. And then I just remember we went out and we didn't enjoy this, I guess is kind of the second part of your question is what would you do differently? We didn't spend a lot of time enjoying this, the title town district and kind of exploring the area because I wanted to get inside and get our seats and do all this stuff. And we got in way too early. Because 
it went extremely late, and there was not a whole lot going on. And Riley was psychotic. She was nuts. She was very young. Um, but she was a complete nightmare the whole time, screaming and hitting the people in front of us and everything. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that's what happened. The fireworks are great. I remember the fireworks afterward. Everybody really enjoyed that and the laser show. That was probably the, the more fun part, aside from the part where we left and, and went home and didn't have to constantly try to corral this little girl on the bleachers as she harassed our entire section. Um, but yeah, I, w- I would probably want to explore more time around the area and um, not bring little children who can't handle being up late. Or just just don't bring your kids, I guess, would be... <laughs> Would be an option. No, that's that's. I'm just kidding. Uh, which Packer player, current or former, would you most like to interview? Um, I, I, I'm kind of weird about the interview things, as far as just you know, a boring sit down. I'd kind of want it to be less formal, you know. In other words, find somebody that has something in common. So, for example, Rogers wouldn't be great, although he is a super laid back guy. So I could see just kind of hanging out and and just talking. He'd be down for that. I just don't think we have really anything in common. Um, I don't think we have similar beliefs or interests aside from football. But again, we're we're not talking about that necessarily. Uh, a little bit, you know, but it's not just a boring like, so tell me about Romeo Dobbs. Tell me about how long you're going to be in the NFL. Tell me about, you know what I mean? Um, I want to say Eddie Lacy, but... The problem with that is there's a part of me that wants to interview Eddie Lacy, partially because he's awesome, but partially because I want to talk about food, and that's kind of unfair because I don't know anything about him actually like really liking to grill or anything. I just, you know, there's the whole weight thing, so that's just me being kind of mean, I guess. Um, I don't know. I, I, I know like Whitney Merciless was big into like grilling, but he's not a Packer anymore. Oh, you did say former, but he was barely a Packer. He played like four snaps. I don't know. I'd, I'd have to find somebody that has some level of common interest to just kind of hang out with, I guess. Somebody, it would probably be an offensive, maybe it'd be like David Bakhtiari and we would just go get wings, you know? Or you know who sounds pretty cool and, and would actually maybe have a shot at uh, interviewing him because he's not really going to be a Packer for probably very much longer is I think it's Cole Schneider, I think is the guy. I've been watching some of the interviews that they do on Packers.com. They've been putting it on social media and stuff. Um, just kind of asking random questions. And that dude is a goofball. Oh, you know what? Actually, Cole Schneider is a good answer. Rashawn Gary is not a bad answer. Not just because he's Rashawn Gary, who's a monster, but did you see his answer to the question of like, what's your cheat meal? And he said like four cheeseburgers and a, a strawberry shake and all this stuff. Dude, I will, I will sit down and eat four cheeseburgers with Rashawn Gary. So I think that's the answer. In fact, I'm going to lobby for that. I think I'm going to, I'm going to reach out to Rashawn and be like, Hey, can we get together and like, pound cheeseburgers together sometime that'd be awesome like we don't have to talk about football at all if you don't want i mean i want to a little bit but you know we'll get some wings get like 100 wings cheeseburgers mozzarella sticks strawberry shakes and uh you know we'll see how it goes see where the day leads and then what's my favorite thing to wear as far as packer gear probably the uh the packers pants that i have with the yellow stripe down the side all i care about is comfort and so I've got like one Packer shirt that's super... The, the reason I very rarely wear Packer shirts is for whatever reason, the vast majority of my Packers clothing is really uncomfortable. And I am super weird about uncomfortable clothes. I can't handle it. Um, I've always been that way. My my parents and grandparents... My grandma to this day, like she'll buy me clothes for, for the holidays and stuff. And the first thing she says is, I had to feel the inside to make sure it was okay. I can't handle like stiff clothes. That's why I'd, I would rather go to Goodwill than get brand new clothes because they're so stiff. I can't handle stiff or itchy or scratchy or any kind of itchy and scratchy kind of clothing. I want it to be worn down right to the point when it's starting to get holes in it, you know, where it's just, it's just like a, you can't even feel it on your body. Those are good clothes, you know, kind of like almost like silk, but not, not silk. I can't afford that. So again, I got like one really nice Packer shirt that's comfortable. And I've got that pair of Packer pants that's, you know, super smooth and silky feeling and soft. And it's just, it's comfy. I like to be comfy. Next up, same caller-ish. Hi, I'm Colin, and um, so do you think every single Packer player that we drafted will be very good? And um, bye. That's the boy. That's Colin. That, that's the one I was able to convert to being a Packer fan, and he is 
arguably a bigger Packer fan than I am, which is hard to say, but it's probably true. Wants to know if every single person we drafted is going to be a good football player. Let's see. Quay, yes. Devontae, Wyatt, yes. Sean Ryan, probably. Zach Tom, I think so. Romeo Dobbs, yes. Oh, Christian Watson, I missed, yes. I think he'll be good. We're, we're, we're being a little fast and loose with the term good, but I'm, I'm going to say yes. Kingsley and Agbar, I'll say yes. I think he's going to contribute in small packages, and I think it's going to, I think it's going to work out for us. Samori Ture, I think so. Rashid Walker, someday. Jonathan Ford, might actually crack the roster this year, surprisingly. Do I think he's going to be great? Probably not. Do I think he'll be okay? I think so. Tariq Carpenter, I'm starting to get a little uh, less optimistic, but I think he's got a shot, at least on special teams. So there's probably somebody that's going to disappoint that'll never make it on the field. Um, But overall, there's not one person I'm looking at that I can say definitively, this guy doesn't have a shot, which is weird because there's always a year where I'm looking at it going, just cancel out the last several. And that, that was my take at first. I thought Tariq Carpenter, maybe special teams, but probably not. Jonathan Ford, zero chance. Rashid Walker, maybe, but real low chance. Ture, maybe, but really low chance. And again, he's Ture right now is one of the more prominent receivers in training camp, which surprised me. But when I went back and looked at all my notes, he's got more positive notes than half of our receivers. You know, Rashid, we haven't seen anything yet, but I, I'm, I'm kind of looking at him as sort of like a Yash Naiman. You know, I don't think he does anything this year, but as the years go on, as guys start to leave, David Bakhtiari heads out, Yash probably will at some point head out, opportunities will come up. So we'll have, you know, Zach Tom will be slotted in there a little bit, and, you know, we're, we're going to be kind of short on guys that can step up and be that backup tackle, and I think that's going to be in two or three years when Rashid Walker's going to have that opportunity, and we'll have kind of built up that ability. So, yeah, we'll keep it optimistic for the boy. We'll see how it goes. Anyways, we got JJ calling in. Last time he called in, his audio was kind of jacked up, and now he's blaming me for that. So hopefully it works, because if it doesn't work again, he's never calling again, and he's just going to assume I'm trying to sabotage him. So fingers crossed, we don't get loud screeching noises. What's up, podcast man? So far, so good. That's my chair, not him. Hopefully we don't have noise. That would be kind of funny. If I just, if they started moving chairs upstairs and I was like, oh, I'm hearing noise, <laughs> gotta, gotta shut it down. I blame on your system, not my phone. All right, I get your it. Your computer is screwing this yeah, up. Yeah, probably it. Anyways, Romeo Dobbs, do you think that it's offensive or permissible for us to call him Black Jordy Nelson? Because, like, the funny thing about Jordy was, hey, white guy can catch. <laughs> Anyways. Pretty exciting. Black Jordy Nelson is a great name, but I do think people out there will be offended. However, I wonder if we start calling him Black Lightning. I kind of like that. That's I'm gonna I'm gonna claim that name and give you fifty percent of the credit for that. Unless maybe I'll run it by you first because maybe you'll think that's offensive and not want your name attached to it. Either way, Romeo Dobbs in my mind is Black Lightning. I love that. Um, you can go with Black Jordy if you want, or whatever you, what did you say? Black Jordy Nelson. I'm going Black Lightning. That's brilliant. JJ is just bombarding me right now, so <laughs> hopefully it stays, stays okay. It's JJ again. Hey. Uh, last night, back in the After Dark. Yep. Phenomenal episode. Loved Thank you. It. Thank you. However, oh boy. took the question from, I believe, Tom, about what former Packer who's still in the NFL and killing it needs to come back for one final season to help us win a Super Bowl. You forgot Corey Lindsley, man. I did. Probably the number one or two best center. That's a great call. That is, I'm still happy with Jamal because I was kind of going with the whole, you know, I, I mentioned form, if, if we're going with a former that's going to help us crush it, I'm still probably going Micah Hyde, although we, I don't know if we need the safety. Plus he's hurt, but... I would probably just hand him um, Savage's job if I'm being completely honest. But you're right. I did completely forget about Corey Lindsley. And I really like Corey Lindsley. And I'll let you in finish. Sorry. Football, and with all our questions at offensive yeah. line, I mean, yeah, it probably doesn't help Josh Myers' development down the road. But the one season to get us over the hump, 
Corey Lindsay. One more time, run it back. I, I, I think it fits the criteria in terms of bridging the gap, right? On one hand, you've got really good football player. On the other hand, you've got a um, guy that was a great Green Bay Packer. Micah Hyde was a good Packer who was here for a limited period of time, and then he went to Buffalo and he exploded. And he is a Buffalo Bill. Uh, you know, he just is. Jamal is a Packer, but he's not going to help us really win much. I think Corey Lindsley bridges that gap. Corey Lindsley is a Green Bay Packer, and I still think he's a phenomenal football player. Um, and yeah, I mean, like you said, it would suck for Josh Myers and his development, just like it would suck for Savage if we brought back Hyde, just like it would suck for anybody else, uh, the running backs, if we brought him back, Jamal back. But um, I, I think all three answers are solid, depending on what exactly the criteria is. If you're just looking for best player, give me Micah Hyde. If you're looking for like a guy that you just really appreciate and want to give him a shot. Although, even even with that, Corey Lindsay might be the better answer. I mean, if we're just looking to attach somebody to the coattails, kind of like we did with, I mean, we didn't bring back Driver, but it was kind of like he wasn't really contributing all that much, so we'll, we'll just kind of tag him along. Jamal as the number three would be kind of cool, because he could contribute a little bit, and he'd be a solid number three. Um, but also, I'm not expecting anything, and we're not really hurting anybody's career. It's just a matter of, I just want him to be here for the ride. Um, but yeah, Corey, Corey Lindsley is, is, is a good kind of in between answer between those two. He's not doing nothing. And he is also more of a Packer than Micah Hyde is one more JJ. JJ again. Cause why not? Yep. Got to do the trio. Can't just Question, call him twice. Uh, which of the frequent <laughs> cast of characters who calls in all the time, you know, Tom Austin, yep. et cetera. Uh, is like the most entertaining for you because I'm, I'm gonna have to say Apocalypto <laughs> for me for sure. I am sad he only called once and and he just kind of walked off into the sunset. No more Apocalypto. I'm actually ticked off. I didn't think of that because the Apocalypto thing is amazing and we need more Apocalypto. So mostly I'm calling in because I just want to send a message out there to Apocalypto. Need to hear from you again, man. I will piggyback on that. Um, Tom cracks me up, although crying Tom is not my favorite Tom. Um, but Apocalypto had me in stitches because again, I didn't I didn't listen ahead of time. All I saw was I could read it as I was about to play it. Somebody named Apocalypto was calling in. I'm like, all right, this is gonna be weird. And then it was a freaking robot <laughs> named Apocalypto. And, um, yeah, that got me a little bit, but just, just because of, you know, you think about this show and I did it once, just, I didn't know if there would be a second episode. I was like, let's just try this thing. It was my wife's idea. Let's just see what happens. Some people called barely had, I don't even know if I did a podcast the second day. I think it might've been the third, the, the third day was the second episode. Cause I didn't have enough calls or something. I'm not positive, but what it's grown into with like all the different characters, you got Strong Bad, you got Thomas Austin, we got Scuba Steve, and now we've got Apocalypto, who calls into the show. It's just, uh, on top of all the great just general calls and questions and topics that have come in, the insanity of this thing that, um, I don't even want to say that I've built, because I haven't done anything. I just put a phone number out there that that you all have built is um, ridiculous and entertaining, and just I'm, I'm just grateful that... Um, it's grown into this. I don't know if anybody appreciates it or likes it. I have no idea what's going on out there, but um, I'm just, I'm, I am, I'm impressed. <laughs> well done. Round of applause for yourselves. I hate to close it. It's, it's 1120 in the morning, but we are at an hour. It's also family night tonight. So I don't know how many people are going to stay up and actually listen to this. Although tomorrow's episode is going to be a little bit late because I'm going to have to get up and do the podcast in the morning, and I'm actually doing something with Clayton at like six, and I am not getting up before that to do uh, to do the, the family night thing because I'm already staying up late to watch that. So it's going to be a late episode. So I'll give it a few minutes, and we'll see if anybody's going to tune in here. All right, we got the one more caller, and it's a brand new caller. So welcome to the show, new caller. Hey, it's uh, Jared Styles down here in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. What's up? Refresh my memory, Ryan and crew, as to why I'm supposed to dislike the idea of getting Mr. Will Fuller on our team. Uh, I can't remember as to why 
we fall out of good graces with them other than the suspension and injury, which, yes, I know, are some red flags. But when he's when he's recovered and, and flying as high as he can, he's, he's a heck of a talent. So just talk me out of it or refresh my memory as to why we're not going to uh, pursue Mr. Fuller here. And uh, if we do, let's see the upside. Thank you, guys. Love the show. Styles out. So um, appreciate the sign out. That was, that was a nice touch. I don't know if we have anyone like that. Um, first of all, I, I, I've always liked Fuller, and I've been on the Fuller bandwagon for a long time. So if we do end up getting Fuller, which I do not expect, I'm, I'm going to be relatively excited. But the first thing is, we can't gloss over suspension and injury because those are two major factors, right? We we did get a free agent. We brought in a big name free agent by the name of Sammy Watkins, and nobody likes him because of his injury history. So it doesn't make sense to pretend that he doesn't exist because he has injury issues, but then go out and say what we should do because we haven't got anybody, because again, he's invisible because of his injuries, is go out and get a guy that has a bunch of injury issues. So it is a big deal. Kind of funny, I just logged into... Uh, PFF and I was all confused like what the heck is this why is this all grayed out except for two teams we've got 2022 PFF grades up ladies and gentlemen preseason grades I I haven't even seen the score this is the first that I'm (laughs) I'm seeing the scores of the game apparently it was 27 to 11 how do you even do that uh Jag or the Raiders kind of spanked them a little bit I'll, I'll be interested to to look at that actually anyways um Raiders 68 overall grade Jaguars 52 Let's get a little full recap of Will Fuller and what he's done kind of in his career, I guess. So Will Fuller, um, 432 speed is his big asset, right? Six foot 184 makes him a smaller guy, which the Packers are wary of those guys to begin with. Let's just start there. They don't like smaller guys because they tend to get injured more. That's just generally their concern. Big guys can kind of hold up. You know, you can kind of lean on them a little bit more. They they, they hold up to uh, the, the rigors of the NFL, but... 4-3-2 speed is what everybody's excited about with Will Fuller. Now, first of all, no idea if he were to run a 40 time what that even is today. Factor in that this was, what, six years ago and however many injuries ago. Do we still think he has 4-3-2 speed? And let me put it this way. If we find out that his his speed, like his clocked speed, and, and granted, 4-3-2 is silly anyways because they're not training to do the 40. But let's just say he went through it all over again, did the best he possibly could, and he's a 4-4-5 guy now. Would anybody even care about Will Fuller? Right, same wide receiver, same skill set, but he runs a four four five instead of a four three two. Would anybody care? I don't know what he runs, but I also don't know that he's a four three two guy anymore. Anyways, first round pick, twenty one overall out of Notre Dame by the Houston Texans. Uh, played for Houston almost his entire career. Um, Six hundred yards and two touchdowns, sixty one overall grade as a rookie. Four hundred yards, seven touchdowns, sixty seven overall grade in year two. Uh, year three was his first breakout grade in terms of uh, breakout year in terms of his grade. Statistically, though, 500 yards, four touchdowns, 80 overall grade. Um, the next year was finally cracked 700 yards, so 759, three touchdowns, 75 overall grade. So still nothing massively amazing. Um, his best year ever was in 2020, his last year with Houston. 879 yards, eight touchdowns, 86 overall grade. Last year, he played two games, weeks three and four, and that was it. And he had a 61 overall grade, 26 yards, no touchdowns. So that's, that is an injury concern. But beyond that, uh, he also did not play the entire season in 2020. He was done after week 12. So that would be a situation. Again, he was great. I mean, he would consistently, his grades, um, 70, 70, 70, 70, 70, 70, almost every game was like a 70. And then his final game of the season was a 92. However, that was the last game he played week 12. So that would be a situation where it's nice and he's doing a great job, but what did it do Houston when it came time for like crunch time, playoff time? Nothing, because he's gone for the rest of the year. Um, 2019, he missed a big chunk. He did make it back for the playoffs, but kind of middle of the season, he missed a big pile of games. So, you know, I'm, I'm not all the way out on Will Fuller. I, I Like I said, I've always kind of liked him. I think he's a good football player. He's not... He's not a thousand yard guy. He's never been a thousand yard guy. I don't think he's a number one guy. I think he's kind of an MVS type. It, it, I don't mean height, weight, speed, all that stuff necessarily. I just mean he's sort of that that speed receiver that's going to stress the defense. I think the biggest reason we wouldn't get Will Fuller is if we go out and get Will Fuller, Christian Watson sits. Period. It's no different than what we did to Amari when we brought in Randall Cobb. If we pay Will Fuller what Will Fuller wants to come in here and play, 
We're taking the 28-year-old, potentially talented, most likely going to get injured wide receiver. We're putting him in that spot. So we're going to have two banged up injured wide receivers starting that are stunting the growth of our... Because remember, if Christian Watson, or excuse me, if, if Sammy Watkins plays, that's going to be largely to the... And, and Will Fuller's there. What we're going to have is Alan Lazard, Sammy Watkins, and Will Fuller, which means Dobbs and Christian Watson do not play. And Amari's not playing because of Randall. So we got three veterans who are on the downswing of their career. Um, uh, Randall hasn't had a really great year in a very long time. Watkins very rarely has very good years. Will Fuller did have a good year two years ago, but I think that's the biggest issue is, is we're, we're so scared of trusting anything. And the Packers just don't operate that way. They don't think that way. And they shouldn't because it's going to hurt because then what happens the, the year after this, right? That's the other thing to consider. What do we do in 2023? What do you do? Do we have to bring Will Fuller and Sammy Watkins back? And we have to pay Alan Lazard and we have to keep Randall Cobb here because Amari's not ready. He still hasn't had any snaps. Christian Watson's not ready. Romeo Dobbs isn't ready. They haven't played. And if we're not going to do that because, well, you know, they got to play sometime. Exactly. Exactly. They do have to play sometime. So let's let them play. Let's stop running scared and going out and getting big name guys that we don't know if they can do anything because we're so scared to let the guys that we have play. Christian Watson is bigger, faster, stronger than Will Fuller. He doesn't have the experience, but neither of them has ever played with Aaron Rodgers or, or with the Green Bay Packers. Let's just see what the guy can do. And I know, well, we, we can't trust it because it's Aaron Rodgers' last year. Yeah, maybe it's his last year. Maybe next year's his last year. And again, we have that same issue. And on top of that, we don't know what Will Fuller can even do. We don't know that he's going to be a good football player. We don't know that he's going to stay healthy or be available at the end of the season. There's more reason to believe he won't than just your average wide receiver, especially a young, healthy player. So... You know, it's just a general philosophy thing. I know fans want to constantly just go get the big name guys. Will Fuller's there, go get them. We need a we need a guarantee, and it's not a guarantee, right? That's that's the reason we need to get Will Fuller's because rookies aren't guarantees. Will Fuller isn't a guarantee either. There is no such thing as a guarantee. Julio Jones isn't a guarantee. Will Fuller's not a guarantee. Sammy Watkins isn't a guarantee. Nobody's a guarantee. But are we going to try to build a a team, or are we just going to? constantly play for this year at, to the detriment of the future. You know, and, and what about uh, our offensive line? Are we really going to potentially have Zach Tom and Yash Nyman playing? Why don't we go get Nate Solder? He's out there. Go get him. Go get Dwayne Brown. Uh, Josh Myers has not proven to do anything. Uh, he, he was quite bad last year, and now he's snapping the ball over Roger's head every single practice. Why don't we just go get J.C. Treader? He's out there. Brian Balaga's out there. Well, go get him. We can get him at a low price. He's only... He's only 33 years old, and why don't we go get Eric Ebron? We don't have a tight end. We don't have anyone that's ever proven anything. Let's, let's take a swing at Eric Ebron. Or how about Jared Cook? He was fine when he was out here last time, toward the end anyways. Let's see what Jared Cook can do. Let's bring him back. We need additional help off the edge. Go get D Ford. I mean, you get the point. And, and, and again, I get it, and I'm fine with it if we do it, but it's not all positive and no negative. There's... there's the only positive to bringing him in is, number one, we assume Will Fuller is going to be a very good wide receiver, and we assume that the guys that we have are not going to be good enough. And, you know, it makes the difference between winning a Super Bowl and not winning a Super Bowl. We have to assume that. If we can't assume that, then we shouldn't do it. And I, I, I don't know that we can assume that. And that's pr- part of the reason why Brian Gutekunst said, we need to see what we have first. So, you know, we're probably not going to get a good look at Christian Watson, but let's just say we did, and the guy is just not a good football player. Um, then maybe. But even then, we might be looking at Sammy and Lazard and Dobbs and saying we, we don't we need to bring in another guy. We just don't. You know, I don't know that we have the best field stretchers in the world, but I don't know that we need to add another guy and, and bench the guys that we have. So just on, on a very basic level of he's a good football player, why don't we just go get him because we have a need and he fills that need. I, I get it, and I do think he's a good football player, and I do think he can contribute if he came here. But I also understand where the Packers are coming from in terms of you, just, you can't just keep running scared and making all these wild assumptions about how things are going to be horrible and we need to fix it and how if we just go and do all these other free agent things, then that's going to fix everything. The priority should always be to work with the guys you have. And when you have young, promising guys like Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs, the last thing you want to do is stunt their growth by bringing in broke-down old guys in hopes that maybe they can build some real quick chemistry in one year and we can go win a Super Bowl 
on some 60 yard pass, you know, in the NFC championship game, that's going to get us over the hump to Will Fuller. You know, it's this big magical thing that we have built up in our minds. Anyways, I appreciate the call. We're going to get out of here. Um, family night, I guess family night's about done. So hopefully everything went okay. Hopefully everybody's healthy. And, um, Again, tomorrow's podcast will be a little bit later. Uh, I'll get to it when I can get to it, but we'll do a a thorough recap. I don't want to rush the time just so that I can rush it. Uh, I want to be able to give a a solid recap. So we'll do that, and I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.